Hello and welcome to your Lab 17 walkthrough. And um, to start out with, I have done some highlighting of things that I want you to point at for introductory. Uh, first off is right in the intro, they're talking about uh, humans and human-induced climate change. And I've just highlighted human activities have influenced atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations. And then over, over to the side where it says emissions and concentration, the least controversial part is human activity has released carbon dioxide and that the concentrations have steadily increased and that we began direct measurement, so taking particles out of the atmosphere and measuring them in 1985, or 58, I'm sorry, 1958. And then they talked about how any data about CO2 prior to that is done in ice core records because every time the snow falls it brings down pollutions with it and locks it into ice layers and we can see those as chemical fingerprints. It also mentions that the two places where we can see natural sources of CO2 is in the ocean and vegetation but currently because the earth is um, has a nice big ocean, great blue planet, and a whole lot of vegetation growing on land it's been acting as a CO2 sink so it's a source of actually absorbing CO2. Which brings me down to the chart below, uh, the 17-1 chart. On the side here it says emissions in GT. GT is gigatons, so it's gigatons of carbon. And then over here where it says carbon concentrations in PPMs, that's parts per million. You can use either side. You can tell me concentrations of energy in gigatons or you can tell me concentrations of CO2 in parts per million. You can do it in either way. And then down below on the base is just years of time. So now let's get started with question one, which question one right away asks you if CO2 concentrations continue to increase at a rate of two parts per million per year, what would be the approximate concentration by 2050? So we can first start out by looking at what is our concentration currently. And we have kind of a good understanding of 2010. So we can take it here and we can see that we are around 390. Right? So in 2010 we are at 390. So on this side up here, if 2010 we are at 390 parts per million, we'll do something with that in a sec. I first can figure out how many years, and so 2010 uh, by 2050, and it should be 2050 on top, sorry, I'm adding confusion. So 2050 minus 210 gives me 40 years. It increases by 2 parts per million per year, so 2 times 40 is 80 parts per million. And so 80 parts per million plus my current rate of 390 plus 80 gives me 470 parts per million. So not too hard, but kind of had to tease out the information. Which brings me into the next section, which I'm going to highlight and then I'll go over with pinpointing. So I'm going to pause really quick, highlight out the um, radiative forces, so talking about sunlight, and then we'll work from there. Okay, so I did some highlighting, because now we're going to talk about uh, radiative forcing. And we just talked about changes to net radiation in the troposphere. Positive forcing, forcing, not loops. Positive forcing means that I can see a net radiation change that will warm the troposphere. And negative forcing means that I will cool the troposphere. Radiative forcing from greenhouse gases can be considered, but then other things need to be considered too, like volcanic eruptions, because that adds aerosols. Um, also, natural things that could occur, and then industrial activity. And so there are a set of lines down below, and uh, some of them, one of these sets of information down in this chart down here, is going to be representative of the actual radiative forcing and one of them will be greenhouse gases in the stratosphere. Another one will be aerosols based on volcanoes and then solar variability and the final line will be tropospheric aerosols. And so it's figuring out which ones is which. And so question two says label which forcing is representative of the bars and label each of the three lines. So right away the bars are going to be volcanoes. So all these bars down in the image down here is volcanoes. 
and it, that just that should just be common sense because volcanoes erupt sporadically and so you can only account for them while they're erupting and spewing there so you would say like bars are volcanoes or uh, volcanic aerosols right that's the bars so then from there we're going to have to figure out what the lines are and the line that's kind of rising up steeply down here that's going to be one that represents the uh, stratospheric, the, the aerosols that are greenhouse gases. So this is the greenhouse gas aerosols in this line. So the dark rising line is greenhouse gases. This one that's dotted, that's going up and down, up and down, up and down, that's your solar variability in there. So that's your solar variability. And then this one that's got the dropping line this is tropospheric aerosols. This is when we started to phase out heavy metals like leads and things. And you can see that our breathing had gotten better. So this grayish line is this tropospheric aerosols down below. So the greenhouse gas one is the top one. This is solar variability. And then this one down here is your tropospheric aerosols, your solid particles. Which brings us now down to question three which asks what is the apparent relationship between greenhouse gas forcing and tropospheric aerosol forcing? How might the burning of fossil fuels affect this? And so let's see if I can clean up down here so that we can see what's going on. Now that we know what each line means, we can basically see that greenhouse gases have increased as the ability to create pollutions that are more like heavy metal contaminants, actual solid pollutions, had decreased. I mean, it does say something, and this is sort of opinion, so you're going to write down things, but it does say something about visibility of pollution or um, how it might affect things or what we can expect for the future. But some sentence that shows that you are thinking for question three um, will fit perfectly and based on the information that you're looking at below. So you're really answering based on what you think for three. So now I'm going to do some note taking again. I'm going to highlight some notes again for you and we'll see if we can get four and five on this video. If not, I will have four and five on the next video. So when we talk about climate modeling, the two things we always want to tease out is the naturally occurring things. So solar variability, so the natural up-down cycle of like daytime cooling, nighttime warming, seasonality, the amount of hours of daylight, versus things that are caused by the earth itself like a volcanic eruption that puts a bunch of aerosols. And so question four, just like in the previous uh, page where we did question two, wants you to determine the three lines down on the chart below on this page and determine which one is the um, solar variability, so the solar, versus the volcano, versus what's actually happening. And the actual happening is going to go back into like which ones are caused by the greenhouse gases. And they're giving you abbreviations that you want that they want you to use. So um, sim temp solar, the T is for temp, sim temp volcano, and observe temp is the OBS. Um, down below, it should just make sense, the little dotted line that's down in here that's really consistent is the solar. <laughs> so when you go to label, that is solar, the dots. And then over here where I see this nice gray line which is going up and down but slowly rising, that's my observed and the light gray line that's kind of variable but yet consistent because we haven't had a major eruption. We would know or we wouldn't know because we'd be extinct. And so this, this kind of normal up and down occasional volcanic eruption goes away, so on and so forth, nothing huge, is my volcano. So now that I've helped you figure out which line is which and you can label those up, Question five should be pretty easy to answer, which just asks, do the simulations with solar and volcanic forcing produce temperature change that look like those observed in the 20th century? Your answer is no. Tell me why. Tell me what's going on. You can use actual numbers. You can say no, because there has been a natural change in the temperature from blah, blah, blah to blah, blah, blah between years of 1960 to 2000, something like that. So be very clear and concise. And on that note, I'm going to make a second video to pick up and answer the rest of the questions for the chapter. So I will see you in video part two.